Our speaker tonight is Dr. Michael Kreitzer. As the owner and optometrist of Glasses Half Full in Edmonton, Alberta, Dr. Michael Kreitzer focuses his passion on his practice, his team, and his patients. He loves to build relationships, which aligns closely with the clinic's mission to offer community-centered eye care in his hometown. Dr. Kreitzer has always had an interest in science, and before becoming an optometrist, he explored several career paths. This included working as a clinical drug trial coordinator with the University of Alberta Hospital Department of Neurology and as a lab technician in a biocontainment facility for the government of Alberta. Seeking a workplace that combined creativity and the sciences, he found that a career in optometry would be his ideal fit. Immediately after graduating from the University of Waterloo in 2017, he opened his cold start practice where, his, where he has been working ever since. Welcome, Dr. Kreitzer. Hi there, everyone, and thanks so much for the introduction there. Um, so I'd love to present, I went slide, one slide ahead, about infection control, PPE, and office reopening. So this is a slide, or this is a presentation that I put together um, along with the help of Nancy Duold from I Would Recommend, who contributed some slides. Um, and just to start things off here uh, to discuss financial disclosures, um, throughout this presentation, I have no financial disclosures to make. Um, and to go through a little bit about our objectives for this presentation. Um, so if those of you, or if, if any of you listened to the I Recommend presentation, which we put out in early May, um, this has a lot of the components of that talk, plus some other components, um, discussing how you can return to work, how you can keep your team and your patients in your office safe, how to use and apply both infection control guidelines as well as PPE, and um, to give a snapshot of what oper office operations are looking like, at least here in Alberta, after returning to work. So um, we hope to get through a lot of this in the next hour. Um, and I just want to discuss a few caveats as well through the process. Um, when I had to have this presentation put together, um, and based on my own research, I have continued to use some of the recommendations put forward by Alberta Health Services. And I know there's some irony presenting this uh, conversation to the Ontario Association of Optometrists, but um, really my goal in this presentation is, is to show, you know, examples of what guidelines in Canada look like and how to move from the guidelines in developing office uh, infection control policies and also what it looks like in actual running of an office. So just bear in mind that there are things from this presentation that may not be applicable to you in Ontario and there are other things in Ontario that um, we don't necessarily have to contend with in Alberta. Um, it truly is it's impossible to make a comprehensive set of recommendations, but um, hopefully this provides you some information and you know some good um, thought pro information we're thinking about moving forward. So um, the other caveat I'd like to give in this presentation is the fact that research in this area is rapidly evolving. So what I say today may not hold true in the next week or so. Um, what I say uh, today may not have been the case a week ago. So just continue to follow the information as it comes out and use your best clinical judgment um, based on the available data in setting your office's infection control policies. So this is the key um, concept that I want to start by introducing, and this is what's known as the CDC's hierarchy of controls. And it is a very good way to think about uh, implementation of infection control policies at your office. So um, to break it down and to walk through these steps, um, working from most effective at the top to least effective at the bottom, we have starting with elimination controls. So how can we physically remove a hazard, um, an infection control hazard? Um, moving one step down the pyramid, substitution controls are how do we replace the hazard? This is not so much a factor in an optometry setting, but it would be, say, in a biocontainment facility where you could maybe genetically modify a pathogen so it's less effective. Moving down again, you have engineering controls. So that's how do we isolate people from the hazard? How can we maximize social distancing in our offices and minimize contact with COVID? Administrative controls are the processes that we establish in our office 
to change workplace flow and dynamics in order to maximize infection control. And then at the very bottom, the least effective control of all, but still important to discuss, are PPE, so personal protective equipment. How do we properly and judiciously make use of PPE in protecting our office and our team? So I want to walk through these individually, and uh, this is something I have um, discussed in previous presentations, but just to walk you through it again, elimination controls, the top of the hierarchy, how can we physically remove a hazard from our work environment? So there are multiple ways that we can go about this. One important way that you see all across guidelines uh, is to conduct early phone interviews, asking pre-screening questions, the key questions that you always hear are fever, respiratory symptoms, contact with active patients, uh, even healthcare workers. There have been recent comments uh, in uh, ophthalmology and optometry publications about conjunctivitis. We'll get into that in a bit. Another uh, common, uh, commonly discussed symptom recently is loss of smell and taste. Uh, one study identified them as presenting symptoms of about 70% of patient co or COVID patients with influenza-like symptoms. Um, and then if your patient has these symptoms that are new, consider an alternate care strategy. So consider offering them telemedicine, consider referring them to a facility that can manage COVID patients, or consider deferring their care if it's appropriate to do so. And any strategy you can take to eliminate unnecessary visits from an office uh, is a good strategy because um, it may be uh, protecting you or your team from a, an infection. And other elimination controls, uh, oh, uh, this is what I wanted to discuss a little bit more about conjunctivitis. And there's a bit of, the, the research has just a little bit of, um, you know, inconsistencies, and we can get into this a bit further, but the current recommendation, at least in the Alberta College's of, uh, side, is that they recommend conjunctivitis be triaged by telemedicine before scheduling an office visit. So here in Alberta, and I believe it's also the case in Ontario, that patients with conjunctivitis can be eligible for COVID testing. Um, and our college has encouraged um, us to direct patients either to the COVID self-assessment portal um, or um, to complete the entire visit over telemedicine to avoid potential even low likelihood unnecessary contact if this were a COVID positive individual. And at the bottom, I'm gonna discuss NCT in a moment. But other elimination controls that you might consider, one thing that here in Alberta, the health service has been doing is performing non-contact temperature screening. Um, this is absolutely not a requirement, um, but it is something to consider. So there um, digital thermometers are available that, through which you can take um, measurements either of the forehead or temple temperature um, to provide quick and easy screening of patients for fever. Um, and if you choose to use this as an elimination control, just make sure you have a protocol in place in your office if the patient does have a fever. And um, thinking through it, there's recommendation to use the ear setting. That way you are not approaching the person face on when you're taking this reading. Um, however, um, this, you know, ultimately something even in my office here in Edmonton, we have temporarily suspended. Um, for one, the COVID diagnoses in town are low, but um, there are other factors about temperature readings that are worth considering. Um, for one, I've received a good amount of pushback, pushback in my office for doing these readings. Um, second, uh, studies of peripheral temperature readings show that they have low specificity and high sensitivity. Um, so what that means, uh, is you may miss patients in addition to all these sources of bias, uh, sweat, gender, age, range of temperature, rate or skill. There are several reasons why your temperature readings may miss people who have, who are positive for fever. So it, it is not a foolproof strategy but it does offer that highest level of control on the hierarchy. So if you are an office who wants to offer and institute a higher level of infection control, you can do it this way. Um, so moving down that pyramid, um, the next one that's applicable to optometry is engineering controls. Um, that again is isolating people from the hazard in your work environment. And um, you know, one, you know, one way that this has been identified is even something like improving your office's air filtration system. So there has been study evidence to show that COVID is associated with ventilation air conditioning systems. So speak with your landlord or um, consider upgrading your own air filtration system to improve your indoor air quality. Um, and look at your, uh, 
look at your test methods, think, you know, are there ways that you might be able to optimize your social distancing with the actual methodology you're using to test and consider doing so if possible. Um, engineering controls in a lot of cases go kind of hand in hand with your administrative controls. So if you implement a new test method, you, uh, you may find that you're also instituting new protocols that go along with them. So we're gonna discuss these two together. So one step further down, administrative controls, those again are the protocols that you have in your office that can be used to improve your workplace safety. There are um, you know, some really intuitive protocols that uh, you can apply. Donning and doffing of PPE in the correct sequence and done, uh, done properly is definitely one. Social distancing policies to reduce the cross spread between people in your office. Um, systems during triage or check-in, or like I was saying just in the previous slide, altered protocols for equipment use. Um, there's one point though that I wanna make here in this slide, and I made it in the I recommend presentation before, which is that thoughtfully applied administrative controls are higher up on that pyramid, and therefore more effective than PPE in keeping your office and your team safe. So, um, you know, to, to emphasize that point, um, when I used to work in a biocontainment facility, their controls in that setting were very, very comprehensive. Before I was allowed to do any task in that in that work environment by myself, there were three steps that had to be done. I had to read a written standard operating procedure. I then had to view my supervisor perform it, and then I had to show it to my supervisor. And only after completing these three steps was I able to do it. So, um, having these system, having your new equipment in place for engineering controls is important, but then ensuring new protocols in place to use it appropriately both go hand in hand. So um, I wanna take a little bit of time to consider some specific optometry specific tasks. Um, you know, how can you ensure you're able to capture the data that you need, but also offer optimal infection control? And when I initially put this presentation together, I shared some questions with the new grad, uh, new optometry grad Facebook group. And these were questions that they had how to approach certain tasks. So I just want to share sort of the research or uh, some information that I have specific to these in the coming slides. Um, but the key is a lot of this is, um, you know, a lot of this is up for interpretation and there's inconsistencies and in guidelines. So, you know, the fundamental thing is use the data that's available as well as your own clinical judgment to set your own individual policy. So first of all, um, this is my consideration of pupillometry in the office setting. So, um, you know, there's an inherent sense of it not feeling safe doing pupillometry measurements on someone where you're, you're within a foot of each other and effectively breathing on each other. Um, and for this reason, I've kind of rethought pupillometry in my office. And as a starting protocol, we are starting just with digital measurements, such as the Opticam. Um, and that we can do at a much greater distance, we found even uh, over the past um, uh, uh, over the past month, a uh, larger distance than we had even anticipated. And then, and only then, if we need to recheck a prescription, say there's something that happens with the Opticam measurements, we will do all of our rechecks using a, pupilar, a pupillometer breath shield. So in the first instance, we're using an engineering control. And then in the second instance, we're using some PPE. Following that up, another task that has generated a lot of conversation and questions is NCT. How can you per safely perform NCT after COVID? Well, there's a lot of varying evidence on the subject, and I just wanna walk you through all of that. Um, from a study in the early 1990s, NCT is shown to generate tear film microaerosols, and an early study in COVID patients, uh, so 17 subjects found there was they were unable to isolate COVID RNA in tear film samples and determined that transmission in the tears is likely low. However, in a much larger study of over a thousand patients, they found that 0.8% of patients had COVID RNA in their tear film samples. And then one, in one case report from Italy found that there was viral RNA in the tear samples 27 days after hospital admission, and this individual had COVID conjunctivitis. So those are sort of a, a bit of background information. And following that up, there was a guideline put out um, related to post-COVID eye care that recommended the use of eye care tonometry over NCT. And a literature review on the subject has shown that ocular infection has been possible in other coronaviruses and urges caution when implementing infection control measures um, in practice. So here we have a bunch of competing evidence and to walk through it all, on one hand, there hasn't actually been any evidence to show that aerosolized tears are infectious or showing that NCT is unsafe. 
And every way that you do tonometry, including eye care tonometry, requires a degree of close proximity to, to a patient. But then on the other hand, you publish guidelines that are um, encouraging other methods than NCT. So the clinical guideline that I just described recommends eye care over NCT and at least three regulatory colleges are mandating eye care over NCT for the time being. Um, and uh, I'm gonna provide a bit more information about additional PPE that may be required based on Alberta's guidelines right now. But those are kind of the two sides to this discussion. And what I just wanna encourage is based on this information, proceed with your best judgment. In my office here, we're using just eye care and Goldman. Next, I want to discuss direct ophthalmoscopy. How can we safely perform direct ophthalmoscopy after COVID? Um, and in, you know, thinking about this one just intuitively, you're extremely close to a patient. Um, I think it just makes sense to consider other forms of ophthalmoscopy instead of direct. So you can perform slit lamp biomicroscopy or BIO at much safer distances. And also you can, uh, you can obtain breath shields or methods of protecting yourself uh, much easier with those techniques. Um, next, we have visual field. How can we perform visual field testing after COVID? And um, there's a bunch of, um, well, there, there's not a there's not a very much, uh, very large amount of information about this here. Um, first of all, there's no data showing that visual field testing rules uh, increase the risk of infection. There's also no evidence that there's any increased relative risk of being in the bowl versus just standard circulated indoor air. Um, going back to that point that there has been associations of COVID spread with air conditioning and ventilation systems. And there's no data, at least to my knowledge right now, about how to frequently intensively clean visual field testing bowls. So um, based on this, um, it appears that you only require standard infection control measures and PPE to run a routine visual field, but there's not much data out there. So it may be warranted to consider additional precautions and some sample ideas. Again, none of these are guidelines, but one, you may consider using a UVC wand to treat the visual field bowl. And I need to emphasize that this is under investigation, so it's not an approved method of cleaning. Um, Zeiss doesn't know if A, treats the device or B, damages the device. So so um, that is a very, um, proceed with extreme caution, but um, you know, ensure your device uses the correct wavelength and use caution because UVC light can burn eyes and skin. Um, second, you could stagger your visual field visits and reduce the patient use frequency. Um, you can improve your standard ventilation or air filtration or just use your regular infection control measures. And again, based on your own, or based on this information, proceed with your best judgment. And finally, how can we safely perform dispensing post-COVID? So, um, you know, the key sort of administrative controls that, you know, we've put in place as an example, uh, only one patient or group in a defined dispensing area to maximize your social distancing. And again, or everything that is handled, everything is touched, is cleaned or disinfected before the next group enters. Um, ideas that are, were early uh, propositions for how to clean things, 70% isopropyl alcohol. I think by now we all know this is not a recommendation to cons consistently use because it causes gradual frame drying over time. Um, UVC boxes or UVC ones. Um, so a precise wavelength, uh, ensuring that the correct wavelength is used um, to treat. But again, there's been recommendations against this because of the potential brittleness that's caused by acetate or on gla acetate glasses if you use rap uh, repeated cleaning cycles on these glasses. Industry sources have pointed out it could cause some brittleness. So um, the recommendations that seem to be in place for now are using diluted uh, hydrogen peroxide applied with a spray bottle and then cleaned after cleaned and dried after application. Um, I follow the standard hydrogen peroxide cleaning regimen of about six to eight minutes of treatment followed by drying afterwards or just standard dish soap and hot water. Um, from my personal perspective, I do find that I can apply the hydrogen peroxide quicker and therefore it's a faster process. Um, dish soap and water um, does require the, the scrubbing time as well as the drying time, but really both methods have been shown to be appropriate. Um, I just also want to point out an Alberta College of Optometrists recommendation about frame sterilization. So um, this is the UV cabinet discussion and um, it, it notes that it's not entirely proven, but it also makes that recommendation to um, further the point 
that um, UV can cause plastic, so acetate materials, to become brittle and dry over time, and recommends your spray cleaning or warm soapy water. So just to follow that up with the guideline. Um, so now I want to move to the bottom portion of the pyramid, personal protective equipment. So the clothing, uh, the garments designed to protect your or the wearer's body from injury or infection. And the question is, what is required in optometry? So again, more caveats. Uh, in every jurisdiction, there's different guidelines. And a lot of the guidelines that we're seeing have inconsistencies to them. So just make sure you meet your relevant optometry-specific guidelines at minimum and use your best professional judgment. Um, I have seen the Ontario Association of Optometrists from Survival to Sustainability Guide just a day or two ago, and it is extremely thorough with all of this. So ensure you consult that, and I believe it's a handout is included as part of this presentation. Um, but then stay on top of changes as they uh, they may develop. Um, and just to walk through things again, uh, sorry, it's the Alberta case here, but um, for eye protection, Alberta Health Service Guideline and Alberta College of Optometrists have an inconsistency. So Alberta Health Services requires eye protection for all healthcare workers that work within two meters of a patient, whereas Alberta College of Optometrists have slightly different guidelines. So they only require it when examining a patient who has a confirmed active COVID-19 infection or there's an additional AGMP guideline, and I'll talk about this in a second, um, uh, that suggests that uh, it may be required for performing NCT, but it's not required for other types of routine eye care. So, um, but then just to go into face masks, so on uh, May 14th, Alberta College of Optometrists actually revised its guideline so that it's consistent with the Alberta Health Services guideline. Um, Masks, uh, that being said, masks are required by healthcare workers whenever they're working at a distance of less than two meters from an individual. Um, one mask can be worn for an entire shift or two masks, one before lunch, one after lunch. Um, that is uh, acceptable as part of this guideline. Um, and so I want to um, also point out, this is the Alberta the College of Optometrists guideline at the bottom. It says much the same thing. Um, but then it also makes a point here about whenever AGMP or aerosol generating medical procedure is performed, a face gap, a mask, and safety goggles are recommended. So I'll just get into what an AGMP is and why that additional layer of protection has been recommended. So AGMP is any procedure performed on a patient known to generate aerosols, quite simply. Um, so based on that study in 1991, NCT is known to generate micro aerosols. And interpreting this guideline based on the research at hand suggests that eye protection is recommended, at least in Alberta, for staff members who perform NCT. But the other side of this is that um, nowhere in the guidelines does it say that N95 masks are a requirement for routine care. Um, what I've offered to all my staff, this is an eye protection option that works great for people uh, who are uh, pre-testing or who are on uh, the optical sales floor. Um, these are 3D printed, made in Canada, uh, face shields that meet Health Canada recommendation. They can be cleaned and reused with rubbing alcohol, and they protect a wider area of the face and be worn with glasses. So these are available at this website. The key, though, for optometrists, it doesn't work with your oculars, which makes it a bit of a challenge. Um, moving on to other PPE, so single-use gloves. Uh, Alberta Health and College of Optometrists have a consensus here, so it's required for any procedure that, uh, that involves direct patient contact. Um, so for use in a single patient encounter, um, there's different options out there. Just make sure if you use latex gloves that you check your patient's allergies for latex. Um, and you know, it can't be overemphasized when we talk about gloves. Um, hand washing is, has been declared recently by the Public Health Agency of Canada to be more effective than disposable gloves for preventing the spread of COVID-19. So, you know, we'll get into the donning and doffing steps uh, in a moment, but just make sure you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with hot soap, uh, hot water and soap, or use an ethanol-based hand sanitizer. Um, and that is going to be the foundation of your uh, infection control control strategy and is very, very important. Um, more PPE gowns, consensus in Alberta is they're not required in an outpatient setting unless a patient has a confirmed uh, COVID infection or has associated respiratory symptoms. 
Scrubs uh, was also up for conversation uh, a lot of, um, when we started opening here in Alberta. Um, and the evidence in this area shows a few things. First of all, there's no established link, statistically speaking, between infectious disease spread and healthcare uh, apparel selection, so scrubs versus professional clothing. There also hasn't been a statistically associated reduction in disease spread with in-office versus at-home laundry. Um, and to back this up with guidelines, at least here in Alberta, is that staff who are um, facilities only require staff to use um, facility provided scrubs if they're working with COVID confirmed or COVID suspected cases. So um, based on this, um, there, uh, there isn't a statistical reason to choose scrubs over professional clothing. Um, and it may be just best to consider factors that are dependent on your office model. So medical offices may prefer scrubs, retail offices may prefer professional attire. Just if you go with scrubs, ensure that you have some protocols at your office in place insofar as when to remove the scrubs. Um, definitely, you know, if you're thinking lunch breaks or uh, a staff member goes to the supermarket after work wearing their scrubs. Um, there are some perception uh, some perception issues potentially, so just ensure you have those policies in place. Um, now I just want to um, show you some demonstrations here uh, insofar as the uh, donning and doffing of gloves and masks. And so for those of you um, who are watching this as a video recording, um, there this video may not work when I send it to you. So um, you can log on. Uh, there will be a provided link to the I recommend webinar. And I think around 22 minutes into that webinar, there will be, you can watch this video and I've recorded it there as well. So just to walk you through, um, for those who want a bit of a refresher and sort of as far as glove and mask donning and doffing. So you always start the process here have hand sanitizer. So wash your hands before you begin donning anything. I'm going to do this hand sanitizer just to stand in for washing. So I'll wash my hands. Now the key with uh, donning and doffing is that when you're doing the donning, the gloves always go on last. When you do the doffing, gloves always come off first. So what that means is I'm gonna start my donning process with applying a surgical mask. So here I have a mask here. Um, surgical masks, uh, the quote unquote dirty part of the mask is always considered to be the filter and the clean part that you always wanna handle with clean hands is the, uh, the strap. So what you do is you just put it on quite simply, loop it around your ears, and um, so what I do is I tuck it under my chin and then I take the wire portion on top and just push it around my nose so you can, uh, so you can develop a, a good sort of seal. This actually prevents a lot of fogging of my glasses when I'm working with a surgical mask in the office. So now here, this mask is looped under my chin and over my nose is in place. Now I can go ahead and put my gloves on. So I have some nitrile gloves here that I'm gonna put on. Just give me a second to do this. So, um, and then uh, to kickstart, so everything is in place now to conduct my exam, and now I've finished with my patient, so I want to start the doffing process. So again, just to remind you, the first thing that's removed is always the gloves, and then the mask is second. So the key with glove removal is to ensure that the outside of the glove only makes contact with the outside of the glove, and the inner portion of the glove is the only thing that touches your hand. So just... Um, I hope you can see this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this, um, pull the material of the glove on the lower portion of the glove out, and I'm gonna invert it, as you can see here, I hope, so that now I'm gonna kind of roll the glove off my hand. Now I have the inner portion of this glove in my hand, which I can then remove by touching the inner portion of that glove to the very base of that glove, and I have made no contact with the outside of the glove to my hand. Now both gloves are um, pretty well off. I can then remove them from my hands and dispose of them safely, and I haven't made any contact with the outside of my glove to my hand. Following that, you always want to uh, wash your hands or apply hand sanitizer between each step of the doffing process. So I have my hand sanitizer bottle here. I will um, do that in order to stand in for uh, washing my hands. And then to remove my surgical mask, what you want to do, so again, this portion of the mask, the, the strap here, is the clean part. You can take it, grasping from the elastic, loop it back around your ears, 
and now you have docked your mask with avoiding touching the filter portion. Now, if different offices have different policies as far as this goes, but you can store the mask by putting it face down on a paper towel that's marked with your team member's name in a designated location. If you're comfortable with reusing a mask, just ensure that when you do that, the scrap doesn't actually fall into the filter portion. So lay it down flat like this, face down. Um, that can be, depending on your own office policy, a way to keep the masks safe and uh, usable for a full shift, um, but that is up to you. So that effectively shows the donning and doffing process. Oh, and at the very end, uh, ensure you wash your hands after removing the mask. So I'm just going to set this aside, and, um, and I have a slide here for um, just a general guide. Um, it says much the same things in this uh, in this uh, slide here as I just went through, but there are some resources uh, for the donning and doffing sequence as well. So, um, so you know, there's a lot of information, a lot of recommendations out there. Um, this is what our office is doing as an example only. So in our office, we're ensuring that everyone who comes in wears a face covering as a short-term measure that includes all patients and all optometrists and staff working within two meters of a face cover with working within two meters of a patient they have to wear a face covering um, we have provided face shields or safety eyewear for um, everyone and that's optional based on the alberta college of optometrists recommendation um, patients are asked to bring a face covering on their appointment converse, uh, confirmation if they don't bring one to the office they are required to purchase one in order to proceed with their appointment it has been at least in my community a very successful approach with minimal pushback and only now when i wrote this presentation it was one believe it's been about three patients who haven't brought a mask so it's been very very successful um, also just to walk you through the health canada cleaning uh, recommendations so there is a website here that i've included that you can look up all the health canada cleaners um, also rubbing alcohol uh, rapid apply, um, applying cleaner hydrogen peroxide for six to eight minutes or hot soap and water um, so a few other things that i want to talk about that have emerged as far as cleaning um, there's been a lot of discussion lately uh, about uvc light and i wanted to share some of the information some of the literature um, about uvc disinfection that is currently available so i split this into two portions one that relates to ppe and the second that relates to room disinfection um, ppe uh, disinfection has been shown to be effective um, for your PPE, or excuse me, UV light has been shown to be effective to treat your PPE, but there are a few limitations that have been shown. Um, first of all, UVC light only um, treats the very, very surface layer of anything contact. So it doesn't, um, it cannot reach the internal respiratory layers. So there can be some active areas of infectivity on a mask that's treated. And second, you really have to be careful with the strength of the UVC light that you're using. So there was a study of various UVC light applications to treat a mask that was uh, contaminated with COVID-19 and higher light applications did significantly affect the filtration performance of some by over 90%, whereas certain applications only minimally reduce the filtration. So just be very cognizant of the specs of your sterilizer if you're using it to treat your respirators. But the current research and a kind of consensus that's emerged is that UVC light may be a practical method for um, disinfecting PPE or respirators if there are low supplies. That's where uh, they have currently established things as far as my knowledge goes. Um, second, I wanna discuss room disinfection with UVC light. And um, there's evidence to support with regards to other coronaviruses. So there's a study performed a few years ago with MERS and SARS coronavirus analogs, and a 10 minute treatment resulted in a six log reduction of active virus RNA. So that's 99.999% reduction, um, which is very, very promising early data. But there are a few important points to consider with uh, uh, resulting from that. First of all, um, UVC treatment has only been shown to be effective for terminal disinfection. So again, it only treats the very surface of what you're applying it to. It is not able to penetrate dust or stains on any equipment. So I've often thought of, you know, my, you know, if I have makeup on my propter, which happens every single day, many times, that would not be penetrated by UVC light. You, um, the recommendations for using UVC light always recommend standard room cleaning ahead of UVC treatment. Um, also, UV treatment is not effective for treating areas that aren't in its direct line of sight. 
Um, more recommendations today is an Ontario Health Technologies Assessment put out a few years ago at UBC, and they recommend um, that rooms should be vacated before uh, routine UVC treatment to reduce risk of eye or skin burns. And this was looking into a hospital uh, level disinfection system. So this could be high, very high by an optometry standpoint, but their quoted price was approximately $150,000 a unit for install. Um, you know, if you're, um, if you're asking about my policy on my ops, I actually have not implemented UVC disinfection because I have enough masks, because UV is only effective for terminal disinfection. So my standpoint is I'm already having to clean everything with Health Canada approved cleaners, everything that's being contacted. So adding additional steps of UV treatment um, is going, uh, would double or potentially double the time of cleaning. So right now, at least the status quo, I've been using standard disinfectants only. Um, so I want to discuss a couple other very key points, you know, especially points when I used to work in a biocontainment facility, I, um, you know, I definitely felt, and that is the psychological considerations as well. So even if you manage all of these points, so that whole hierarchy um, on uh, that put forward by the CDC, there is still a psychological challenge that's present um, working in, in an infectious disease environment. I definitely felt that when I used to work in a containment lab, it was one of the most demanding jobs that I've ever worked. So I just wanna offer some ideas and some early takeaways that I'll get into in a little bit later. Um, don't force your team members back if they're not prepared to return to work. Consider offering hazard pay um, to supplement their employment income and take on more testing yourself if it's appropriate to do so, expand your mental health leave or sick day benefits. Um, and then, you know, if all else fails, um, we can do everything right. We can do everything on that pyramid and there is still that risk that that's, uh, there could be a potential infection somehow in your office. Um, there's risk that uh, asymptomatic individuals can spread COVID. There's risk that COVID can be spread just simply from your air conditioning symptoms. So what we've implemented and what I um, recommend is having a disclaimer process as part of your revised check-in, just notifying patients that you are taking all the necessary re recommendations and precautions, you're meeting the PPE requirements. But despite this, there is that risk of COVID spread that you may not be able to mitigate. If a patient isn't comfortable that level of risk, it may be uh, prudent to wait and defer their visit after the public health order is lifted. So I just want to briefly go into a few slides here related to um, the office flow. These are things that Nancy put together, Nancy and I recommend. Um, and, you know, the goals here are these three points. So isolating people from the hazard, protecting your team, protecting your office, and um, thinking about how you work and maybe using those strategies to optimize your infection control. So, you know, just to give individual points, these are, you know, it's, it's not meant to look like a laundry list. It's meant to just show you individual ideas that would be, uh, you know, would be considered at each of your office touch points, reception intake, using your screening in advance, notifying the rules about what your office has implemented ahead of time, uh, ensuring individuals wear a mask as a requirement on entry using hand sanitizer, restricting the number of people accessing your office, and removing unnecessary things from the front area. Um, you can also perform different methods of intake. So you can collect everything over the phone or verbally, and then your, you know, potential, uh, your potential um, plexiglass versus social distancing barrier. We'll get into that a bit as a way to create some separation. You may also want to consider a temperature check. Um, then moving from on the front to pretest, ensuring you have your PPE in place, of course, um, using uh, clean equipment, making sure everything's thoroughly disinfected, using different methods of collecting data if it's safer to do so. So again, eye care versus Goldman versus NCT, um, using your discretion as far as what you use. Uh, and then cross-training your staff so only there's one handoff versus multiple in the pretest process. And then exam room concepts, uh, same PPE, uh, breath guards, breath shields, um, ensuring that everything's thoroughly disinfected, those key points that are coming through this whole uh, portion, using uh, techniques that result in greater distance and the, the uh, potential to increase PPE between yourself and the patient. And if there are certain conditions, even certain conditions with a lower risk of um, COVID like conjunctivitis, if it's appropriate to triage that with telemedicine, consider doing so. 
Um, so sales strategies that you may want to consider, again, using different types of pupillometry, digital pupillometry, for instance, uh, breath shields, uh, putting those in place using plexiglass shields or um, social distancing barriers, cleaning everything thoroughly, just like every other one of these, um, ensuring that uh, everyone has a different workstation um, and tools, so you're not sharing tools, ensuring that you have social distancing markers on your floor to optimize spacing between people. You may want to try to increase your tap limit on your point of sale system. Um, and, you know, trying to limit the contact points. There's a few points up here, um, just having strategies to talk about what glasses people are looking for before every pair is tried on, um, having meetings with reps on line if possible and again like I said before doing pre-adjustment appointments and having a contactless pickup method to reduce the number of visits your um, patients need to make to your office as well. Dispensing and adjusting um, so you may uh, again use the same uh, plexiglass shield disinfecting PPE approach um, I found it very helpful to have the patients put on their eyewear. So you're making a transfer. Um, if you receive the eyewear, uh, have the patient set it on the table, have them back away. You pick it up off of the table, do an adjustment. You set it back down on the table for them, back away. They pick that pair of glasses up and put it on. And you can look at a two meter distance to see how is that fitting see from a two meter distance how the nose pads fit it is possible to do look behind the ears have them move their own hair out of the way the whole adjustment process and the whole fitting process can be done at a safe distance um, and then contact lens again disinfection ppe doing online meetings using videos to teach and then making use of what our contact lens partners have offered in terms of generous shift of patient methods um, so this is where I have added a lot of new material. Um, I want to talk about my experiences as part of our relaunch. So um, for those of you who don't know, Alberta has been open now for one month. So today marks one month officially of being reopened. And I want to walk you through some of my challenges, some of my experiences, and how we've actually implemented some of these infection control policies um, in our office setting. So, um, you know, there, there are a few guidelines that I want to examine. My apologies again, these guidelines weren't available in Ontario when I put this presentation together, but I still want to focus just moving, you know, have a conversation moving from the guidelines to the actual reality of practicing. Um, in doing so, I'm going to discuss a few important guidelines. So first of all, Alberta's specific back to work guidelines. Second, the return to routine care guidelines that have, uh, were prepared by the Alberta College of Optometrists and that are very thorough. Um, I also want to talk about how certain points of these guidelines can be implemented in order to uh, maximize your infection control and um, some considerations as part of our new normal. Um, First, so to discuss the Government of Alberta Back to Work guidelines, um, a lot of the points in this guideline mirror our takeaways, as a matter of fact, from previous slides. So hand hygiene, ensuring maximal social distance, um, surface disinfection guidelines, um, and lo and behold, this. So here we have the hierarchy of controls. Um, you do find it in many provincial guidelines, many other guidelines, and that recommendation is still in place. So using engineering controls as your primary method of control, then second choice is administrative controls, and the third and final choice is PPE. So I just want to really emphasize the point that using the hierarchy of controls to, um, to look at all aspects of your office operations and to make decisions based on the hierarchy of controls is an evidence-based method to optimize your office's infection control, and it's rooted fundamentally in the guidelines. So, um, but I also want to talk about a few other guidelines that, you know, the, the, um, the college guidelines or the other, um, the other upper health services guidelines um, didn't quite go into the same level of depth about. And these are some business guidelines related to um, workers and COVID. So, um, first of all, in Alberta, businesses must screen their workers on a daily basis for COVID symptoms. Um, second, um, if an employee is sick, there's mandatory self-isolation for an employee who's sick. So um, any employee who de de develops any acute COVID-like symptoms, and the list of those symptoms is long and extensive, are required to self-isolate for 10 days or until symptoms resolve, whichever the two is longer. However, if they receive a COVID test and are 
negative for it. In that case, they must still self-isolate until their symptoms are finished, but they don't necessarily need to wait those 10 days. Then um, the other important point from a, a managerial standpoint is if an employee develops these symptoms in the middle of a shift, they must start self-isolation immediately and don't require a doctor's note. Um, and the third point is any worker who's exposed to COVID has a minimum quarantine period of 14 days. So um, those are all very important considerations to make. And uh, um, there are similar um, guidelines in place in Ontario that are definitely worth, uh, worth investigating. And also um, another guideline in Alberta says that the employer, so any employer must record names of all close contacts any sick individual has been in contact with. Um, and that way, if the worker tests positive for COVID-19, they can contact those individuals and perform contact tracing. So, you know, in an op optometry setting, it's actually um, relatively straightforward. Um, I've been recording names of every person presenting to the office, including for order pickups, for adjustments. So if someone needs contact tracing or if there is a need for it in the future, we can do that. Um, so following up with some points from the Alberta College return, return to Routine Care Guidelines. So there's a few additional points that are worth considering. Um, first of all, um, there are uh, triage points for uh, protocols for patients. There are protocols for patients who aren't sick, those who are COVID suspects, and um, staff protocols, um, how to implement safe staffing and stable works, uh, workstations in your office. And I've had a chance to look again at the OAO's uh, survival to sustainability guideline, and I think that that guideline does an absolutely incredible job at breaking it down at showing different options. So I don't want to go into that too much because I, um, I I, I want to spend some time talking about some other you know, just more practical considerations here in the office that I've had to contend with upon reopening. Um, so I want to discuss concepts for how to designate workstations to people. Um, there's a second point here that may be less relevant for an Ontario standpoint, but one I struggled with quite a bit was um, mounting clear breath shields to all of my equipment. and. Um, and uh, the barrier question, how to implement barriers in your office and how to uh, maintain st safe distancing. So um, first of all, so dedicated workstations for staff, um, optometry's, uh, Alberta Optometry's Return to Routine Care Guideline says that, um, says that the best approach is to ensure that office members have dedicated workstations and office supplies for at least the full working day and uh, ensure that cleaning disinfection of the touch points on that office occur before use from another employee. So that's what it offers as sort of the gold standard, the best approach, and trying, you know, thinking through how can we possibly implement that in our office, especially when people are moving around, trying glasses on. But what we've done is I've assigned dedicated workstations for all of our staff where they're required to do almost all of their office activities. And then there's the inevitability of shared touch points that are beyond that. So I've written individual policies for all of the uh, shared touch points in the office so that it's known and there's something in place for how these are dealt with and how they're cleaned um, through regular and shared use. Other things, so ensure your team members wear the required PPE, especially in an office space, and are screened on a daily basis for COVID symptoms. And I've seen a few points recently um, in different optometry channels wondering, you know, how could we staff associate doctors who work multiple locations and each office has a different policy? And I think that if you have these four principles in place, so you, you have shared workstations and workstations and shared, um, you know, office two or pardon me, you have individual workstations and individual office tools. You have cleaning policies for shared touch points that are known for everyone in your office, including associates. Everyone wears PPE and you institute daily screening for COVID symptoms. In that case, I do believe there can be a systematic approach to allow your associates, even if they're working in multiple office locations, to return to work at your office and do so in as safe as a possible manner. So I just um, thinking through these things is really important when it comes to ensuring the continued uh, you know, ability to work and maintenance of work of everyone at your office, including your once a day associates.
So this, I just want to show you what I have done. And what I did was I just took a layout of my office and I've color coded it. So we know that these areas in particular, so we've assigned areas, the color, one color belongs to uh, me, one color uh, belongs to a pretest member, one color belongs to the team member who's more in the lab or doing adjustments. And then each of these red squares, I have uh, administrative controls written because they're the shared touch points. So there's there's policies in place. How are these areas of the office, these shared touch points, used safely and to maximize infection control? So just to give you an idea, having this information, sharing with everyone, including your associates, can offer high level of administrative controls to protect your office and your team. Um, second, I again, I don't know how um, I don't know how much of a factor this is in Ontario. Um, here in Alberta, we are required to mount breath shields to every one of our auxiliary ancillary testing devices. That includes, you know, my keratometer, topographer, OCT. There's no commercially available breath guards to my knowledge for these, so I had to kind of make them myself. I used um, acrylic signage, which I could cut with an acrylic knife and double-sided tape to the device. And it was very cost-effective and they're very effective at providing breath protection. But again, I don't know if that's a factor in Ontario. Um, so other options that are available are front, the, I wanna talk about front desk barriers. Um, so they're in a two meter, um, so there's plexiglass where there's physical barriers. Um, Plexiglass is great because it offers full coverage of respiratory particles if both parties actually stay across from the barrier. And if you have less than two meters, um, they're the only option that's there. But, um, you know, in my experience and, you know, being, say, at the grocery store or other places with plexiglasses, individuals often will lean around a plexiglass display. Um, and that, to me, is a big advantage of a physical barrier. It ensures that everyone maintains their distancing at all times. They're also more cost effective and there's no fixturing required. Just to give you an idea, this is what I've done. I put two IKEA tables up. So um, it provides a space a little over two meters. And on this table, I can put everything I need. I can put our COVID policies, the disclosure, a symptom checklist that I get my staff members and my team to read on entry, and then the hand sanitizer, which is required on entry. It's, it's very simple, but it's easy to clean between patient visits. Uh, everything we have on here is fully cleanable and offers that spatial barrier that you need. Um, so I just want to take a couple more minutes. I know I'm running low on time, but I want to take a couple more mis uh, minutes to discuss the new normal and what that looks like. And the thing about the new normal is there's nothing normal about it, and it's not the same for any of us. So there's huge differences, and one of the most important and major differences that has happened in this new normal is staffing-related changes. So you know, here in Canada, there's been a massive disruption, massive change in the labor market that's resulted from COVID-19 resulting in huge amounts of temporary and permanent layoffs, massive shifts in the workplace, so moving online versus in the office. Um, and, and, you know, that other point where um, there's different levels of comfort and um, you, your staff have different return to work requirements, which I believe should, you, you should be respected and understood. So I did a quick survey in Alberta to gauge this effect. Um, so I put a survey out to Alberta ODs on Facebook asking if given the choice to return to work, what percentage of your staff do you feel would choose to be back? Um, and this is what I got. So um, most people said over 50%, but not all would return. Uh, some said all, uh, all and some said under 50%. One large office said that about 40% of their office members would not return. And um, the, the important thing is understanding this impact on your business operations is critical to understand what that new normal looks like. So a very common discussion point I've heard lately, how do you manage staffing in your post-COVID environment? And, you know, there's some really important points to make here. And I can definitely speak to this having worked in a biocontainment facility, understanding the, um, the psychological difficulties of working in an environment with infection control, and then also uh, being a business owner in this environment too. And I just, you know, I really want to emphasize other business owners to respect the physical and the psychological challenges that are associated with returning to work. Um, you know, parents with children who may not be able to return them from school, um, you know, uh, susceptibilities to infection. I mean, there's lots of considerations everyone has to weigh in. And being there for your employees, listening to them, and 
uh, being supportive as much as you can, I argue, is a far greater benefit in the long term rather than maxim maximizing your office staffing over the short term. And even you know, in my position, respecting every staff member's individual return to work needs and considerations, you can still run your office at a level where you're still respecting the financial obligations of your lease and other necessary expenses. And I just want to show you this briefly because my experiences are very different. So my, in my office, initially speaking, now this has completely changed right off the get-go, none of my staff were in a position to return. And I want to show you just how this shaped out insofar as you know everything goes. Um, with you know with the understanding that my role here as a manager is to you know respect and to listen to my staff and to ensure that they feel comfortable with the work environment and the infection control measures that I've implemented. So what I've seen happen a lot here in Alberta, you know, the question how do we run our office, how do we set patient scheduling and availability, I argue the best way to do it is to match your flow plan to your post-opening staffing level, so of associates or staff who want to return to work. But the key is respect the physical considerations, respect the psychological considerations, and don't force your staff back to work if they're uncomfortable. You know, if you are in a dire need, consider recruiting because because of these labor market changes, there's definitely a high likelihood of excellent hires available. And then use the emergency subsidy to offset your staff costs if you meet the criteria. But you know, just looking at it from the um, staffing level down to the patient flow, I think that in all instances you can do everything. Uh, as appropriately as is possible. So respect your individual staff's needs psych physically and psychologically and also run a sound office operation. So a few examples, 100% of staff wanting to return, you can run 20 to 30 minute slots, but one doctor and two exam lanes and have a dedicated team member on disinfecting each lane between, um, as it flips between the doctor. The other way is you have less than 100%, you run a bit longer visits and then you have your disinfection period afterward or you have less than 50%. So you run a super tech model, you split patient testing with the optometrist and you as the optometrist and your super tech will work together collaboratively to maximize your flow. And um, you know, just to give you a few other problems with the flow uh, before I kind of get into the last slides here. So um, in, in order to maximize that flow, just a few points that I've encountered in opening, there's a lot of frame try-ons by an individual or by a family, all of them need disinfection, or say you have too many touch points in the office, so too many uh, places where you keep your patients or you have too many guests or visitors in the office that all require disinfection or you have your patients waiting in an interior uh, internal waiting area that also needs to be cleaned. Um, here in Alberta a lot of offices has required their patients to wait in their vehicle until contacted to enter so giving about 15 minutes notice just to allow for cleaning and disinfection. But you know having that flow plan, having the appropriate number of patients in your office for the level of staffing you provide um, is in, in my opinion, a good way to get your practice going after this and ensure you have everything in place. And the more staff you have returning, the more you can repeat and work your same float or increase volume. So it's been very, very difficult this month, but respecting all of your individual needs of the team and associates, uh, accommodating your doctors, your associates, the office is able to run, uh, and then Beyond anything else, prioritizing your patient experience, um, it'll allow you to open your office, restore your operations, maximize your infection control, and con uh, continue your financial health of your office, even with low or lower than you'd like staffing. So, you know, just to give you the kind of bare bones of it all, in my office here, um, compared to right before COVID, we had a fairly significant decline in gross debt revenue over the first three weeks of May, comparing to the first three weeks of February. However, looking back a year, we actually, with this staffing approach, we um, of respecting a hundred. This is based a hundred percent respecting our staff members' uh, individual needs and allowing them to return to work when they were comfortably to do so. And having that respect in place and then running the office based on it, we were able to see 16% growth over the first three weeks of, a, uh, of relative to the previous year. And then from payroll standpoint, I mean, the point of this is not to make uh, comments about the payroll, but just to say that you're respecting your individual staff to work's needs. And even if there is a, a 
lower increase or a, you know not you're not seeing the growth that you might want to see in other offices you you've respected your team and you've reduced your payroll costs so it's a win-win for everyone involved and then most importantly of all you're able to offer um, a great and well thought out infection control policy that patients are looking for these days so just a few, this is the last slide, um, with a few challenges in the exam room that have been really commonly discussed. So avoiding phoropter lens fogging. Um, there's lots of things that I've discussed, probably more than this slide allows phoropter lenses fog frequently. So you can have them tell you when they fog and then pull it away anyway through an unfog. You can put tape strips on top of their masks to give it um, a little bit more of a seal. Um, you can apply anti-fog to your phoropter lenses. Um, so again, slit lamp bio microscopy lenses fog frequently is another thing. You can pull back from your slit lamp and wait for your lens to unfog. Uh, keep, I've seen on uh, ODs on Facebook, people keeping their lenses on a warming platter to reduce its fogging, um, which I've heard does work, or uh, consider obtaining routine photos. And then one challenge I had a lot of difficulty with was my slit lamp breath guard initially was way too small, so I had no protection looking around my oculars, so I wanted to avert a lid, but I wanted to express my Bohmian gland, look at where the 90D lens was, it just wasn't doing the trick. So I made a larger breath guard. I feel much more comfortable and I can see around it a lot better. So, um, but yeah, I don't want to keep too much more of your time. We've hit exactly an hour here. So um, I just want to thank you all for your time. Uh, remember to wash your hands. It's the number one thing in this whole lecture. And I just want to now allow for any questions that anyone has. Um, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kreitzer. So I will now share the questions that were submitted. The first question, from the studies that showed post-COVID-19 results from tear film, did the subjects present with conjunctivitis? Were they positive even without conjunctivitis? Um, my understanding is that the in, in those studies, uh, they the individuals in that study of 17 did not present with conjunctivitis. So that was where no viral RNA was found in their tear film samples. But then in the case report where there was viral RNA found in the, in the case of the Italian, uh, the Italian woman, um, there was conjunctivitis. So the key question is, uh, you know, if you have conjunctivitis, especially in the presence of other respiratory symptoms, um, you know, there there is a low risk, but still a risk that there is COVID RNA in the tears um, based on those studies. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm not sure if you answered this when you talked about UVC, but someone is asking, what's the correct wavelength for UVC to disinfect? Uh, it was somewhere in the 250-ish nanometer range. I'm, I'm so sorry, off the top of my head, I don't know it. Um, let me, uh, yeah, it's, it's around two, uh, 250. I don't want to misquote on that. So um, it's uh, it's very commonly identified, though there is a specific wavelength that's most associated with it. Okay. We have two questions about masks and gloves. One yes. person asks, what's your opinion about reusing uh, surgical face masks after air drying for five days, five or more days? And another person is asking whether uh, you would consider washing rubber gloves between patients? Um, so uh, to answer those questions, so um, I, am, I am comfortable with reusing, uh, I just want to make sure that I follow the Alberta Health Services and Alberta um, College of Optometrists guidelines insofar as face masks. So um, meeting the guideline, I'm just going to reuse that mask for an entire day. That can mean taking it off and putting it back on multiple times that day, so long as you do so without contaminating the mask um, and, and keeping it dry and those fundamentals. But I, um, I am not yet reusing my mask just because the guidelines say um, to use one mask per shift. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I can't comment on the actual like rate of infectiousness or if the protection varies, but just to follow the guidelines. Um, and then with gloves, same thing one glove per person to follow the guidelines, disposing between people. And again, that's only in instances that require direct patient contact. So if I'm looking across the room and looking at someone nose pad fits or the temple fit behind their ears, I am, I'm not needing to put gloves on because everything the patient says it down, I pick it up. But if I need to touch the person, gloves are going on and they're getting disposed afterwards. Okay, thank you. And regarding putting on gloves, which step of the eye exam would you put them on, right upon greeting the patient or just before touching the patient's eyes? Um, I have been using, um, 
from my standpoint, I've been putting gloves on. So I wash my hands when I enter the room still. Um, I will uh, use rubbing alcohol to clean several things off. And um, when my hands are dry enough, because when you when you have wet hands, it tends to rip the gloves and they get stuck in there. So after my hands have dried, after a bit of cleaning and a bit of case history, I'll then put gloves on just in case. I don't know when I'm gonna you know need to look at something or um, use my hands. So I'll, I'll put it on relatively soon, but just after they've dried a bit, so I'm not going through too many gloves because they are vinyl gloves especially depending on the quality that you have but there is a tendency to rip mm -hmm. thank you another question what's the best way to clean goldman tonometry probes uh i i would uh, use the well so any infection any method that um is using a Health Canada approved cleaner is going to be effective at uh, killing coronavirus. But um, going back to you know any your, your college guidelines that are in place for anything that touches the eye um, require a higher level of disinfection standard. So using your hydrogen peroxide in those cases, soaking them, spraying them, is going to be that guidelines based approach to treat your probe. Okay. Next question, how do you reduce fogging of lenses when trial framing? Uh, yeah, I mean, trial framing, uh, I, I, have, I, I have experienced a bit of fogging, but not as much. And maybe that's just because my trial frame sits a bit further from people's noses. Um, you know, it's a, it's a matter of removing the glasses and putting them back on. I mean, fogging can get excruciatingly difficult with uh, with any set of lenses. You can um, offer the person tape and again form a seal with the tape uh, between the top of their mask and their cheeks. Uh, just make sure the person's okay with that. You can offer them uh, say a paper towel and, and fold it and, and offer to put it in between their nose and the top of the mask just to have a little bit built-in material there to direct their breath elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the, the unfortunate thing is there's no best answer in this case. It's sort of whatever works in every individual situation, and a lot of flexibility has been required through this whole reopening process. Right. Another question about fogging. How do you minimize fogging of slit lamp diagnostic lenses from the patient's breath? Oh, yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. Um, what I've been doing, generally speaking, so you can treat them with anti-fog, but um, I've been just warning people in advance, like, I'm gonna have to come back a few times because this thing is gonna fog and I'm gonna lose my view. So I look for a few moments and pull it away, wait for it to unfog, look again. But again, I have seen that, uh, that there's a video that was recently published on ODs on Facebook where an optometrist had his uh, 90D on a warming tray and it was reducing the amount of fogging it had considerably. So you can, if you, um, if you have something just lightly but not significantly warms the lens um that will also reduce the fogging um but you know it's not always like there's a right answer in that case either right what about hepa filters in the exam rooms um i've i've looked into hepa filters and i was just shared a video about hepa filters um i think that a hepa filter is a interesting and a, a good idea to consider um for the dimensions that an exam room is um, I, I see only benefit from installing a HEPA filter, both from indoor allergens to air quality to potentially reducing, um, you know, filtering viral particles. So, um, you know, it depends on the filter's thickness and absorption and other factors like that that would need to be looked into. But I think it's a sound idea. Okay. Um, are you suggesting that we have a staff report or keep track of all the outside contacts? Um, if that is, I think, um, I don't, I don't think that, um, that's necessary. Um, you know, I think that the more important thing is, uh, encourage your staff to follow the public health orders, obviously. And, and if, if they are sick at all, make sure that there's a system in place where there's no penalty, that there's um, you know, an understanding that you know, they should self-isolate is really, really important. Um, uh, keeping contact of, or keeping names. I mean, your staff go to grocery stores, your staff go elsewhere where con you know, they may not know all that information. Um, you're, there's already enough that I feel as a business owner, I need to keep track of and, and be very cognizant of. I think that that's an added layer of complexity. I don't think I would um, feel comfortable already tracking 
but um, you know, if uh, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a tough, tough call. Mm -hmm. I have another question here. Do you recommend that doctors share rooms or should each doctor stick to their own room? What if you work on different days? Should another doctor use your room when you're not working on your day off? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, I think that the best way to do it is to, you know, like I sl said about the workstation slide, having a dedicated workstation or in our case, an exam room for a day. And then if you're in your workstation, you do all your activities at work in that room for the most part, wear PPE when you're out of that room. Um, that way, you know, you have your own space. You don't need to worry about cleaning absolutely everything you touch off, but just the points of contact for patients um, and the key points of contact for yourself. And then when you finish your day, then you can do a very thorough and rigorous disinfection and pass the room off to someone for the next day. Um, I think that's a good strategy, especially if you're in an office with lots of associates and there's lots of shared spaces to, um, you know, offer a, at least a degree of control from an administrative standpoint uh, to improve your infection risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm conscious of the time, but we have two more questions. So if yeah. you're okay, I'd like to yeah, post those two. Um, should scrubs be taken home to be washed? Um, so again, that comment about um, there is no, um, in, at least statistically speaking, there's no relative risk reduction from at, or at office or at home laundering. So um, based on the evidence at hand, there is from a laundering perspective, nothing, no advantage to doing it in the office or at home. But in Alberta, the guidelines say that if you have, say, scrubs, they need to be changed out of when you get home, you know, right when you get home. Um, and you know, I would recommend from a public perception standpoint to not, you know, to ensure your staff don't wear those scrubs out anywhere on the way home. So make sure they're docked at the office if they need to go somewhere else before going home. Um, those are the two main things that I can think of, but statistically speaking, there's no increased risk of infection from at home or uh, at office laundering. Great. And the last question, can you suggest where you can get HEPA filters? <laughs> uh, no, I can't. Uh, actually, it's been a real challenge obtaining anything on that sort of uh, you know, even you know, any procurement of anything that's going to offer infection control. When I was looking for my non-contact thermometer, it took me uh, weeks to find a supplier. And if people are going out of supply routinely, it's like finding, uh, I feel right now, gloves. I mean, your disposable glove suppliers will have them for a couple weeks or for a couple, you know, one week, and then they'll be out of stock. So I can't right now, I don't know where to find them. No, one of our doctors on the call just said um, she went to Costco and got some HEPA filters today. There you go. So, so Costco. May want to check Costco. I haven't been to Costco in a bit, so. <laughs> there we go. Well, at this time, I want to thank you, Dr. Kreitzer, for this very insightful presentation and for your time on the call tonight.